Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Well, thank you, Charles, uh, for hosting me. And also, thank you, November. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's the reversal of roles. You know, it feels really good. And um, thank you for coming today. It's, you know, for the, for a, on a Sunday, uh, after Nuit Blanche. It's sunny outside. And uh, some of you who, who know me, uh, they, they tagged me, uh, I think it was two years ago, where they called me Mr. Sunshine. Um, because I'm depressed all the time, pretty much. Uh, so that was Charles Asia, by the way. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to run through uh, some ideas in the next 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Uh, just bear with me. It's questions on, ins on institutions. This is something I've been, uh, I've started working on last year. Um, it's still in a, in a kind of a draft form. Uh, so your ideas and your input would be great. Okay. So exhibitions are inherently fugitive, fragile, imperfect forms. More than often, they are not the most efficient narrative agencies. They cannot be taken off the shelf and leafed through like a book, replayed like a movie on a screen, or repeated as a dance step. They cannot be recovered. Once done, they can be recalled only as the event they are not meant to be. But they are not events. As a time-based practice, they have short shelf lives. They replace each other tediously in a simple mimicry of the convenience store. Things are put on the shelf and then taken off. The shell remains the same, however. The duress of incessant programming of exhibitions that come one after another with sell-by dates make ideas obsolete before they are actually exhaustively unpacked. As good as it lasts, but not for that long. Unless, of course, they are stale to begin with, Ascribing to the condition of the so-called permanent exhibition, permanent collection exhibition, that only very few institutions challenge today. By normalizing the rhythm of exhibitions and building spaces to accommodate that cycle, we circumvent the possibilities of how art may come to transform itself in the future. Hence, most of the art we see activates itself, itself towards institutions. This forces, us to register new, uh, this forces us to register new ideas that might, for example, not have an exhibitionary goal or mentally and structurally, uh, positionally outside the edges of our practices. In a way, each time an art practice engages in a critique of the institution, it is at the same time an attempt to pursue a discussion with a zombie. The question is twofold. What are the ways what are the ways the practice of the present time that do not have to begin with an exhibition in mind? And how can an expanded model contribute to the presentation and discussion of past work? And this is not merely a formal exercise, but a need and a necessity. I doubt otherwise that decolonization of the museum will ever take place. That is to say, exhibition, exhibitionism and coloniality emerge from the same root. And without making exhibitions not the center of activity of an institution, we cannot imagine the future. Late capitalist exhibition model and exhibition practice in late capitalism is about being present, about presencing in the present. As such, a representative institution of its time cannot be contemporary. By contempor contemporary, I, I subscribe to a notion of having a friction with the moment, a dissonance. And this, you should, we should not confuse this with the idea of, uh, with the process of becoming contemporary, which is, there's also neophilia. Neophilia and newness is about more or less a divergence from, uh, divergence anchored to what is already familiar. Mere presencing suppresses comprehensive analysis in favor of perfunctory treatments. This reflects an institutionalized condition where there is no possibility for an institution to allow itself to change through the actions it commits to. This is not only due to a lack of time of, for reflection. The change is seen in the context of a program, the completion of after which the institution unchanges or changes back to its old ways of, and regards it as experiments uh, where failure or success is not that relevant. 
So this schizophrenic condition between an institution's performance and what it purports to be needs to be unpacked. The schism marks the abdication of the institution's responsibility and role and commitment. What is an institution other than what it does? Its research, its publications, exhibitions, and public programs. Can it have an identity beyond that? From the end of the 70s, museums have been subjected to an economic condition of perpetual deprivation. Like healthcare and ed education, they have not been immunized against the volleys of the emerging turbo cap capitalism. When money began to shrink in the public realm and accumulated into the hands of a few, museums followed the money. To offset the perils of a decrease in public funds and support, they retorted to both living with the new conditions and largely benefiting from them. Their alternatives, the efficient outposts, built from scratch by the elites, the oligarchs, fared even better. I have no intention, as you will see further on, to pitch public and private against each other, on assume and, and kind of position myself in a higher moral ground, no. To the contrary, the, har the harmony and the rapprochement between ownership models tells us a lot about not, you know, tells us about not to overplay this difference. In short, panhandling to the elites and autocracies that replaced the traditional broad-based civic and locatable classes, museums became clumsy neoliberal operations. They became something else. And the kinds of institutions that chose not to dumb down and join this charade were singled out as odd, quirky, as temporary experiments not to be taken so seriously. These loners face the threat of falling off the grid all the time because their frames are ever so singular. Hence, with expanding development teams, experience and management units, asset, asset marketization, they turned themselves into representative institutions of their time. They turned their capacities and potentialities as assets to be marketized and brand peddled to secure the present moment. We could claim that they forfeited their future. Institution time. How can institutional time be reimagined? It's essential to recognize that institutions exist in three, di in three different times concurrently. Exhibitions perform in the present time. Meanwhile, the institution is a heritage machine bearing and asking questions to unresolved, ignored, absented, and obscured stories from the past. And also negotiating, fermenting, testing out, in the best case, possible futures. And the museum's mandates used to be quite clear, to do everything in their capacity to advocate for a better world than they received. And better here is not uh, like an ambiguous term, and this was ICOM's mission statement up until 10 years ago. At the most basic level, an ecologically maintained world with unobstru unobstructed rights to knowledge, common resources, fundamental services like healthcare, education, and equality of species, including those species that do not have a voice of their own. That's what the museums are supposed to do. To support, cherish, and voice these rights is not becoming political in a narrow sense of the word. It's simple decency. Because if the clock is ticking for the human species, as some claim, we can delay our demise with some dig dignity. I used to believe that the museums does not have to take a side, but only present a strong argument to help people make better and more informed choices, decisions. I'm not so sure now, but we can talk about this a bit later. If institutional time is not the present time only, what would be some of the ways to become contemporary? One strategy is to be transparent and opaque simultaneously while keeping these two actions completely separate. Most amazing contributions to public thinking were fermented, tested, and negotiated away from the threatening gaze of the order, away from the Philistines, shared half-truths, and populists. This need, in times of an ascendant global fascism, is becoming ever more urgent. We have, not, we have to nurture and protect. Hence, since an institution is a monastery as much as it's a church. But it cannot be a church looking like a monastery for the cognizanti, or a monastery looking like a church. It can neither be a, it can neither be a public space where only privileged voices are, ang are, are echoed, nor a protected space where all ideas are equally worth discussing. These things have to be kept separate from each other. 
transparency and, and, and opacity overlap only in a performative and unpredictable condition. The sudden condition of radical empowerment of society, for ex as, as we know, that is never uh, lasting. It's more like what Zygmunt Bauman, uh, the late Zygmunt Bauman said, uh, uh, has called a swarm recently, when referring to Occupy movements in the Arab Spring. In the moment of sw swarm, opacity and transparency are one and the same. We work in a trajectory of the past and the future, which, makes we, which means we have multiple publics to, uh, to account for and to take care of. The public of the present moment, a public that keeps arriving from an unresolved past, a past that will not go away, that has to be constantly confronted and pushed forward. Lastly, there's a future public, which is why we do what we do. So the institutional public is a plurality that does not privilege the moment, and any decision we make in the moment has an effect on three temporalities, which includes changing the past in the present. As Walter Benjamin had written, if the past insists, it's because of life's unavoidable demand to activate in the present the seeds of its buried futures. This notion of a history and future uh, collapsing into the present moment trumps the classical approaches to the assessment of an institution. Now, a core issue here is to underscore the notion of the museum situated as a non-capitalist institution embedded in a turbo-capitalist economy. And please note that there's a difference between anti-capitalist and non-capitalist. The first is a political condition, while the second is a public condition. It was the only condition that was not to be surrendered by the social state or the welfare state. Anti-capitalism is political. Non-capitalism is about public time that holds a society together, which turbo-capitalism has helped erode and decimate. So the average lifespan, for example, of a private company is about, what, 75 years? But public time is supposed to be infinite, is expected to be infinite. The museum is three centuries old, and that makes it much uh, older than most countries' economic and political systems. So what does management imply? Management types are brought in to increase operational efficiency and cut costs. And we have always relied on the same argument. What do art historians know about running a museum? Doctors about running a hospital? Professors running a university. Really? However, there has never been a model of neutral success that allows for a better fiscal and operational strategy without a substantive shift in the institution. The managerial approach has given way to at least two generations of directors who may have the proper background in art history, but they have embraced a different role altogether. Finding a recipe for mere financial success does not make a director great. Management also means monetization of certain assets and conversion of other assets to liabilities waiting to be unloaded. Asset analysis leads to increased loan and service fees and ends at times in heedless deaccession. So certain tools of the museum become asset class objects with unaffordable high loan fees Take, which take the smaller institutions and less powerful institutions, less powerful institutions out of the game, which means that denying the public of those institutions uh, the possibility of experience, experiencing the work. And other tools of the museum become liabilities, like orphan objects, ready to be shipped out or auctioned off and handed to the private sphere. They are no longer regarded as unique insights, testimonials, or indispensable, indispensable tools to tell stories. So the outdated role of the keeper connoisseur has been replaced by a network of curators entangled in a grid of collectors and dealers. Cutting costs means smaller research departments and smaller curatorial departments and increased outsourcing and contracted services. That is to say, the core operations of the museum become serviced by third parties and temporary staff. To add one more spin to this, spin to this scenario is the new workplace culture. And especially rampant in the cultural sphere is that the museums are increasingly stuck with itinerant knowledge workers, where a sense of belonging is replaced by a notion of a station on a, on a career. 
So institutional royalty and vice versa, similar to the business world, have been completely transformed. All this opens way to institutional blunders, bloated development funds, and other non-essentials such as reliance on headhunters and consultancy companies. Institutions have strong strategies to delay their end through mergers, takeovers. Remember, first takeover like PS, uh, was, uh, PS1 was taken over, over, over by MoMA. Brand expansion, which is the Guggenheim model. Uh, administrative centralization, which is the Pompidou and its branches. Streamlining or divestiture of assets, as we have seen at Berkshire Museum, uh, that sold pretty much all of its collection uh, two weeks ago. I mean, selling all of its collection, permanent collection, and asset capitalization. Yeah. So this paradigm, which means simply handing over the institution to contemporary desire, one, a desire that privileges the, priv the, the present moment over any other. We are living, as we all realize, in the ever-present. Management rules in a horizon of less than a few years. We are stuck in a present without a direction. As we lose the sense of horizon, we get more stuck in the present. Our colleague Manolo Borjavier said we are trapped in a past in which we don't recognize ourselves and a present we don't like. And Manolo continues to say in a discussion with Charles Zesche that the situation promised an illusionary, li illusionary life in the infinite present and changed the ways humans perceive themselves and their position in relation to each other and to time. You can also call it post-history if you prefer. Post-history emerged at the end of the 1980s and ushered in an era of no, no conflict after the fall of bureau communism, followed by deregulations and chipping away of the welfare state. Now, there are few, ever few reasons to be cheerful about the world we inhabit. With less than a half century left for our species, that sees every other living or inert being in subordination or as a form of resource or of, as a form of waste, a massive deterioration of income balance that resembles the late 1920s, and normalization of institutional and societal corruption. In such an accelerated present, it should, should come less than a surprise to conceive the realm of the institutions as museums as part of the problem. We are part of the problem. So it does not help at all when MoMA puts up a show of paintings by Muslim artists in response to Donald's travel ban. It's a public relations gimmick and does not change the fact that MoMA is funded by oligarchs and that its programs have not, at any level, questions what brought us to these days. So institutions offer neither a sustained criti criti criticality nor a counterpoint. We can restore them to a historical position without the col colonial and imperial baggage of their own past. Is that's a fair question. But even then, the institutional role is limited more to restoration than transformation. This limits of its commitment have to be recognized as well. That's another point to discuss. Who are we royal to? What do we care about? Who do we talk to? Who do we talk with? What is the world we want to live in while knowing the impossibility of reaching it? Lines of our royal loyalty have to be realigned so as to address not the tribal and self-serving interests of those who act in the name of the museum, and not simply get down by this private-public dichotomy. Now, deeply problematic within the institutional sphere is that museums are neither on the side of the artists, nor do they seem to be there for public interest. So there's a sharp contrast between their jargons and their actions. While this discussion has to be parsed further to bring an end to the nearly meaningless dichotomy, and understand what better what it means to have a tribalized, privatized interest, Fine. I mean, to place the burden on privatization is correct. However, this situation e impacts equally public and private alike. They are private and public funding are, in effect, privatized interests in a representational system. Now, there's a sense of helplessness when, where institutional actors are uneasy with this situation. But at the same time, they are unwilling to draw conclusions from them, from the ex ex experience they are subjected to. And they do not investigate why they perhaps cannot claim their historical position. There are not only the vested interests, but also the institution's imperative to survive. Surviving in this case is not a particularly commendable act. And it's not linked to any capacity that needs to be protected or nourished. You don't have to survive. 
The question is not that we need institutions, but what kind of institutions we need. And worse, the level of cynicism, the sense of resignation and lack of imagination has become pandemic. Is it possible for cultural institutions working with, within context of real, ex, real estate expansion, privatized interests, and culture and proprietary rights to respond to the times? And I'm not speaking of knee-jerk knee reactions to daily politics or assuming a pseudo-lefty humanist position of the classical art world. We are no longer dealing with specific science, but with a global situation. No place is that local. It is essential then to resist the spectacular, the privatization and theme parkization, theme parkization of social life and turn our compass to a more democratic project. Now, Chantal Mouffe had suggested that our larger objective is transforming institutions into a terrain of contestation of the hegemonic order. But this is maybe half right. Because the order can hardly be located, it's embedded, and without its decolonization, without our decolonization, hence the contestation of our own positions, not much will actually change. What we can do, at best, as institution, is develop positions where we can be ready for it. The museum world has been embedded in a network of relationships that preclude public purview. That is to say, it has become a pre-public or post-public realm with dispositions and residues presented to a plebeian consumption. While the outputs appear to be similar as before, the processes through which decisions are made or taken have been privatized in a self-affirming global network. Looking at it from another angle, pub, private and public, again, is not the question as, uh, as long as the overwhelming con is concept is about a passive receiver, an audience, a viewer, a visitor, that lacks the capacity, the tools, and the agency to articulate its desires. This power-based lack of communication between the institution and its outside needs a rethink. What remains outside does not have a place for its desires to be recognized and seamless spaces are offered between the customer and the provider in a charade of market-tested exhibitions, and the possible pu public is extracted from the equation and replaced by processes of managerial quantification. In more than one way, it seems we have switched models along the route and not fully realized it. Between the museum ideas of the late 18th century and the late 20th century, fundamental shifts have taken place. But it's not a time we can go or need to go back to. In fact, the model of the institution that has appeared in the last four decades, since the 70s, is in alignment with the diegesis of the originating narratives of the industrial fair and the theme park. Specifically, it follows the theme park reincarnation of after World War II. Secure and safe, uh, tamed place for middle class families is a form of, uh, again, clean and branded tourism that answers to all of one's needs from shopping and eating and childcare. I was watching an interview with Tom Kranz recently, you probably know Tom Kranz, is, you know, is the uh, inventor of the Guggenheim model, and I was dumbstruck by his valorization of the theme park as a viable example of for the museum world. It seems I was correct in my conjectures regarding the double legacy of the museum practice as residing not in the history of the museum, but in the theme park and the industrial fair. So this decoupling from the museum heritage was precisely the point. Many of the big players in the main cities have already accommodated many as aspects of this new double legacy. As a consumer heaven and leisure time producer forecasting a tourist class that keeps on swelling with the incorporation of new audiences from India, China, Sub-Sahara, the Gulf and Southeast Asia. Citizens all have also been downgraded to a tourist class. This is, of course, not all they do. An institution is many things. It's never a one thing. Uh, but keep in mind, also keep in mind, what made certain empire institutions stronger have been the relationship they have recently entered with the rest of the world. I mean, we, can, we think of this as a very, very positive thing, but only 30 years ago, they had framed all these cultures they, have, they are invested in now as, uh, as being outside historical time, outside their linear time. 
They don't anymore because they need the customer and they need the money. This transformation is coupled with what I call powerless socialization. This is an experience that helps all aspects of a notion of a publicum, which is then reduced to an experience such as a congregation in the new agora by their own volition as part of their role in the design of the space. However, this public participation in such spaces is about a managed inclusivity. That people congregate and get together in these spaces can hardly ever evolve into anything constructive. Despite lofty declarations that speak of museum atriums holding political potential, these are not the places of a beginning of a new democracy. They will not become potential agoras or process, places of mobilization. They will, not be <clears throat> they will not offer the tools of, towards self-determination. In powerless socialization, there's hardly anything that connects the audiences by way of necessity. Mostly, the museum has become a pleasure space. It often summons, it often summons a tour de force architecture, and the exhibition experience is reduced today to the visitation of new sacrosanct edifices of star architects. This sacral experience is not about the actualization of a bona fide civil society. It, in fact, hinders such an attempt and reduces the potential of activating culture's capacity in helping shape a society. But it's instantaneously branded for what it is. It's a place coextensive co with the tourism and leisure sector. Consumer exposure is sublimated with brand recognition. And such a model, in order to survive, needs non-stop real estate expansion and construction. So otherwise, it will collapse. So like most things in the late capitalist economy, this exhaustion from consumption is part of the script. Death is premeditated, inevitable, and purpose-built. So when you see museum expansions in cities and power corridors like Hong Kong, New York, Moscow, Berlin, don't be surprised. Expansion is about survival. Expansion is also, rec is also a recognition of an end, so, but it's not a paradox. In fact, this model does not embody a single paradox. What we often see is the reticulation of the same artists and architectures, names, artworks most indistinguishable, indistinguishable from each other, from one institution to another, and narrative hierarchies that are more or less accommodating each other. They look like each other in a grid of compatibility that suppress the obvious absurdity of the whole enterprise. Meanwhile, museums outside brand cities keep on unraveling. A dire script has been in front of them for the longest time. Their locatable historical support class has dissolved. So has the civic sector. Because the new support class knows only of the vertical order. It's not grounded. It's unhinged from time and space. And often looks only to London, New York, Los Angeles, and other power corridors. And it will park its stock of talents wherever, it's, wherever it desires. I mean park because it refuses to respect uh, historic, historical norms. Park because it literally parks in terms of long-term loans, often protected by hard contracts. So unlike the horizontal and distributed support classes of the bus, pa past, simply, you know, there's a difference between a museum membership of $20 a day for 1,000 people, that makes 20,000, versus one person giving 20,000. And you can multiply that. So guess who has the power now? What takes more effort to raise? And what you have to do to make that one person give again? Now, it did not take a genius to forecast such a historical transformation as second cities began to spin into a crisis over a decade and a half ago. But it was nevertheless too, too hard to surrender for, for, for any subject born into a welfare state. They thought that, what, that the hell we live in today was momentary, that it, would, it could pass. So instead of testing and introducing new methods, they preferred to remain obstinate to the challenges, effectively subjecting themselves to increasing the anemic conditions and often insolvency. At the same time, the administration of the museums began to change. When managers 
begin to administer institutions as if they were companies, just like hospitals or univers uh, universities, they become subjected to an increasingly managerial logic. And as the curator and former museum director David Elliott had remarked, management has become, an elevated, has become elevated as a skill in itself that has no relation to any particular discipline or knowledge. Now, unfortunately, to expand on what I said before, most of the managerial reconditioning ends up in an ingest more of the poison that got them sick in the first place. Again, the point is not about the survival of the UN institution. That's not the question. Surviving is neither important nor essential. It's about rethinking the institution's promise and keeping it germane through changing times. A survivalist attitude without a core mission makes the institution even more vulnerable to tribal interests. And tribal interests are in the business of leverage. Why do we live? Why does anything live? And is there a dignified resignation? So short-term panacea could be tantamount to turning museums into zombie institutions. In short, when museums with a public service mandate enter as non-capitalist institutions in the late capitalist economy, they enter a field in which they have no public endorsement and have to abide by the protocols of instant, instant assessment, short-term efficiency, and become the servants of the time in which they operate. These institutions are zombies because they don't know they are dead. Now the kernel of the problem lies in the tension between the contrasting economic models and the way a historical public institution and contemporary capitalism have completely different ideas about what public good constitutes of. And this museum, this museum world has been increasingly like uh, encircling the power corridors. And power corridors are the kind of spaces where energy and arms markets crystallize with financial markets forming the outer shell. Now, places and institutions that do not fall in this category of the spectacular, places that are below the network radar, get phased out of the presiding narratives. Medium-scale medium institutions keep on disappearing, like institutions in the second cities. The art centers, ICAs, Kunstvereins have much less traction than before. The middle keeps on dropping out because there's an increasing market demand for large-scale institutions. And these smaller operations were not octopoid in reach. They were not tooled to accommodate branded projects or complex sponsorship schemes. And the middle is, continues to evaporate or is forced to scale up under intensely privatized and competitive cultural spheres. It also drops off because sponsorship is fertilely directed to institutions with brand value. In short, as an economy, money concentrates in the hands of a few, the middle disappears, and the small is destitute. Finally, there's the itinerant subject of the precarious knowledge worker, and even precarious institutions, that accept these protocols, and they always try to stay ahead of the game. They're kind of brilliant until they burn out. We know that the museum is not what it used to be, but and has not in general developed into a system of rewarding frameworks. There are still too few institutions that don't merely act as the equation pl platforms of their time. No longer the eternal exhibition on par with the church or the city hall and the public square. The last 35 years has been more than a measured transformation. The public and the museum of the 250 plus years have been descaled as part of this epistemic shift. So it's both harder and easier to institute in these times, in view that the normative blueprint has become inoperative. So it's wiser to ask broad questions and manage the ebbs and flows, trusting that things will take, somehow take care of themselves. So a cardinal rule for a new institution would be incorporating and welcoming contradictions and failures. To be clear as acetate. Another is to develop a culture that looks at things from different disciplines and incorporating academic discourse that is open to public. There is also need, the, need, the need to welcome new tools that enable the public imaginary to flow into and eventually transform, institu into, transform the institutions. The task is to address the visitors who are not ready and captive audiences 
who are certainly and rightfully doubtful of museums, in which there are no narratives that incorporate them. But we should also not force an over-identification. The task is also to denaturalize the institution's presumed authority, or at least accept that it's only a presumption to be reasoned and disputed. It's essential to not simply utilize, but invent new tools and agencies, releasing the burden of being location-specific. To be clear and, and be open about controlling the levels of institutional transparency, because you will control, but you have to be transparent about what you control. And never use the language of the royal plural. In short, if an institution can no longer be public because of its bylaws, how does it become public? And the point is not to interpret the world and present it as a kind of commodity, but to be in it and accept the consequences of this complex co-location. In the 20th century, there were times when museums were able to dispute the systems that supported them, but they were at the same time tied to them. That was recognized as the role of culture and institutions within a civic democratic project. But the question for today is how production, mediation, and dissemination can be re-democratized. And what effects would that have on our museums? Would such a dispositive propel us to rethink the institution's role in society? Maybe a few words about SALT, where we, were, we both were for six years. I mean, SALT, SALT was different. But I don't think the work we pursued at SALT was unorthodox. It was, in fact, deeply rooted in history and institutionality. And we never tried to be novel or radical or cutting edge. That would be formalism. We actively attempted to cushion the impact of market and disregard most of what seems to be in or what is acknowledged as exceptional or, you know, or, or pedal, pedal, be peddled to a kitsch cognition. I mean, I always claim that we programmed, and we still do, for people who are much more intelligent than us. Because not, people are not simple-minded, and they don't need to be infantilized. So given the tools, they are amazingly crafty in making collective decisions. And that the institution's attitude to audiences are often quite preachy. So we exercise what we called, at the beginning of a project, which was called a state of unknowing. And this is not a cute, like, uh, version two of a museum in full accord with like business of uh, cozy collectivity, creative economy, and all that. For Salt, the idea was to enter an agonistic sphere where difficult questions can be posed without being incriminating or, or simply hostile. And we were lucky because Salt is not an artwork-based institution or collection-based institution. Hence, there is considerable luxury of looking at objects without their routine handicaps. Focusing upon research and treating what we work with potentially as discursive objects. So we became much more involved in the actualization of, the capacity, of their capacity. As such, our question was not about custodianship, but shaping novel narratives and top telling multiple stories of art, and not one story. And history is not fixed. I mean, attempting, a, attempting to invent a canon is delusional or authoritarian, or both delusional and authoritarian. In continuing with the treatment of objects and things, salt from its very beginnings, disengaged from the curatorial. We did not have curatorial positions because the way we work acknowledges, does not acknowledge the curate, a curator as an auteur class actor or a classical keeper. So Salt's dispositive was to visualize research, what we have been calling a post-curatorial approach, where different subjectivities from the professional, academic, or purely curious are, and interested are assembled around the project. The result does not quite look the same, but most importantly, how we get there is quite different. And we question the departmentalized, compartmentalized master plans from the very beginning. As Jorge Kepesh had written, ignorance, inertia, but mostly fear that we may be forced to give up vested interests has kept us from pooling our knowledge. So dismantling the obtuse results of departmental arrogance was a place to start, and it's not only semantics. We actively engage with art and other things from non-discipline limited angles. 
and attempt to make informed decisions based on rigorous, independent and open research. So if you cannot link your work with the prerogative of thinking beyond the purely monographic, chronological and medium-bound and similar approaches, you cannot proactively create different frameworks. Without these frameworks, we cannot invent models that are faithful to art and its practices. And we have to be open to incorporating contradictions into our discussions, that there's no, because there's nothing more dangerous than a non-straight, striated, smooth space. And diversity and being open to your lack of competency in any interdisciplinary practice is a must. So if compartmentalization was a bad idea to start with, it had become entrenched with an obstuously arrogant professional jargon over many decades, especially in museums. While non-medium specific departments, departments have been no-brainers for a very long time, the anxiety is real. Some institutions even produce intercuratorial positions, interdepartmental positions, then offer stopgap measures, but at the end, departmentalization is bound to disappear. So in short, SALT provided a unique climate where different sets of knowledge clashed and benefited from each other without arrogance. I, I believe that the desire to build a museum, a museum in the 21st century stems from a kind of self-doubt. And it's an arrivist uh, concept. It may be self-orientalizing and it's certainly not very original. And it's somewhat unfortunate that most people working in non-Western contexts choose to emulate Western models of the museum. To pursue a model that has been invented 200 years before for a context that cannot be translated to a new social and cultural context is, to say the least, odd. And it seems, and it's for sure, I think it's for sure that the condition of coloniality or condition of coloniality has outlived colonialism. We decided not to grow in an evolutionary manner. We did not follow an industrial model. Instead, we redefined for our case an institution for the 21st century and tried not to repeat the mistakes of the past. What kind of people do we want to grow with? How do we shape a reality? So incrementalism, incremental growth was not allowed. And a colleague made a great remark in an interview in 2009, I repeat this all the time, uh, during our expert dis discussions, that perhaps articulate what I'm trying to say best. Uh, we had these expert discussions with people from all walks of life, uh, I mean professionals, but uh, not only art professionals. Um, to, we, I would ask them what they, what, you know, what, how they would imagine a future institution. And Marcus Novak said, you can look at evolution as fitness, which is sort of an industrial way of understanding it. Or you can look at evolution as diversity. And it's much more interesting to figure out a mechanism for producing diversity, which requires the fostering of mutations. They can be applied culturally to the functioning of an institution or to the content of what's shown and what's created for the purpose of not fixing categories, but constantly producing new ones trusting that the rest of the culture will take care of fixating it. Nowak's metaphors about the evolutionary and industrial model could be taken as a kind of trying to achieve a limited excellence. You know, and by limited ex ex excellence, I mean, you know, uh, we can all run the 100 meter dash. I will do it in five minutes. Usain Bolt will do it in 9.80 something seconds, but we'll always get there. It's, it's just the distance, you know. So that's, and that's for me, is a limited excellence. That is to say, places with unremarkable thresholds where there is pretty much nothing that cannot be anticipated. So from our beginnings, we, were, we have been thinking of the concepts of users, communities of interest, professionalized audiences, constituencies, as opposed to terms such as audience, customers, or visitors. Not that all cannot exist concurrently with an institution, but we cannot be a different thing for each person or a group. And unfortunately, we don't yet have the tools that they enable our visitors. They have to be invented. SALT is kind of slowly morphing from a broadcast institution to something that develops intelligence with its users, 
collective intelligence, if you will. And for the audience to become embedded and active, one needs many organic interfaces with trust and caring. So our question is the following. What are the strategies for establishing ethical, non-hegemonic agencies and agonistic conviviality? Our benchmark has not been the mass media or the headcount, and certainly not the occult methods of da data aggregation. We are, not, we are only interested in genuine reactions. For example, how our projects have been translated into curricula in the university. How it moves people out of their slumber to look at the world differently and work differently. We like to assist people with the goal that they become more hopeful, more intrigued, and more prone to making informed decisions. And we like to do this without being preachy or talking down in, an, in a process of engagement. We don't have a hegemonic desire to address each and every unprivileged person or group or employ military ter terminology like target audiences. What SALT instead does is engage in discussions and platforms for debate that reach beyond the traditional support bases. Perhaps with the hope that engagement with different segments of society with, will turn them, some of them, into constituencies and councils and translators into their communities. So there has been a taxonomy of embedded institutions within SALT, collaborations, hosting, and simple allocation. At different levels of visibility, these institutions could be working groups released from the university due to their political beliefs or their people who don't or not align with the government, NGOs, documentary film festivals, performance groups, human rights and LGBTI associations. Hence, the cultural and social and civic education is realized in a wider, wider perspective, and we can't benchmark that. A critic had written on SALT uh, that it attempts to realize the kind of multidisciplinary research-based practice that normally individual artists, collectives, and short-lived art centers have been able to pursue. I really appreciated this response, this note, as it spoke to one of our goals of thinking the institution as a flotilla of individual votes as opposed to a mothership. So SALT is shaped by this multiplicity of experiments and ideas. Its failures and relative successes are there too. There's an artistic culture that permeates the place without having always to deal with art. And the questions we started with in 2007, and when we opened in 2011, are at some level history now. However, to put things in perspective, some of, our, some, quiz, some of our questions were, what should a future institution look like? Can we scale up without yield, yielding to fame and fake and blockbusters? And can we retain our agility? And we did not want to run SALT in a centralized manner. The guiding ideas, the motivation, and the spirit and the collaboration should be close to each other, but it shouldn't be run from one place, not from one nerve center. We thought about a certain ecology of things. For instance, how to have a wall system that does not require repaint or, and a constant waste production for each project. How to make a debranded institution. How to create forms of communication that completely bypasses or has no interest in mass media. Because we seek a truly, and we thought that through the interdisciplinary dialogue and the absence of a pristine commercial gallery-like environment allowed us to open the field and understand our buildings as tools, simply as tools. And it's all about stimulating curiosity, and curiosity does not have a discipline. At South, we preferred artists, exhibition makers, and graphic designers, uh, designers or really anyone who is involved in our projects, to enter into a relationship with the context that is more based on process, not process as, as a fetish, but real working process, and less on the objects to be displayed. It's not something that we planned in anticipation, with, with anticipation, but I should say that it's a side effect of the relationship that we establish with our collaborators. We learned from it. And the architecture of the buildings as well was a case in point because we work with not one architect, but with eight different architecture groups in negotiating the spaces. And, 
And this kind of, I mean, this was, uh, you know, if it was one architect, uh, one top-down plan, the same chairs, tables, everything, and this, you know, for, for all units, etc. It would have created this kind of strange, almost corporate uh, environment, where, as opposed to, we wanted to kind of, you know, to different ecology for each space, for each function, uh, and, and also and also support new design concepts, but also reissue older design concepts. So when we actually f finish a project, it's still a bit problematic. I'm not talking about all the exhibitions, all the projects we do, all the programs we do, but uh, we try to expand the time frame with post programs. Sometimes we release publications months and years after a project. We serial, serialize exhibitions in the form of what we call modern essays. We established almost year long exhibition series as if they were radio plays and sometimes go, issue, or go at issues again and again from different angles. And all of this is done, not in a grand sense of historical correction, but as prototypes producing subjectivities, hoping that the rest of the culture takes care of it, uses it, plays with it, and develops it. This is in accordance with our position, main position, that art and exhibitions are not for everybody. We are not here for the masses. That is to say, we cannot be interested in an entity that has no shape, that cannot be abstracted or voiced. But we are extremely interested in anybody that we can enter a discursive, agonistic, supportive discussion. And we can see in clear terms through our projects that these temporary communities can be produced, have been produced, nurtured, and revisited. Thank you.